Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly. My co-host for today's show is Tanya Todd, and our guest is Richard McDonald, Renee Winner, and Marcus McFadden. And the topic of the show is writing scripts. So, Tanya, I'm going to let you start off. Why don't you introduce Renee, or at least, what do you know about Renee? Well, I know that she wrote a really fascinating book about Smurfs. (laughs) 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 All right, Renee, why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, I was a writer in Hollywood for a lot of years with television shows, and I wrote a couple films. When I moved to Las Vegas, the first book effort was about the Smurfs and the animation industry and subliminal programming of young children's minds. And then I went on to write uh, four other books since then, and I teach at the College of Southern Nevada here. I teach creative writing. All right. And Marcus, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, uh, Marcus McFadden uh, started out only as an actor back in 2009. Um, about 2013, I decided to start my own production company. My first film was Love Triangle. Um, back in my early acting days, I actually booked a gig, uh, Transformers 3, um, which actually allowed me to start my own production company. I produced, uh, directed about 13 to 14 films so far. Um, currently in pre-production for about three. And you have a television series coming up. Yes, and a television series coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just to name a few. Well, let's not forget about that one. That's the big <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, a few things going on. All right. And Richard, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, like Marcus, I am uh, started mainly as an actor. And then I saw that uh, there wasn't a lot of work present. So, And I had talked to a few different people that said creating your own work is really powerful and really important. So I ended up uh, writing and creating a short film that uh, I just released and it's making the film festival circuits called Ethically Ambiguous. I'm in the process of writing two other short films related to that one and then I have a TV series in mind and another feature film in mind. And Tanya, why don't you introduce yourself? You're with the Henderson Writers Group. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background? I am the education chair for the Henderson Writers Group, and I run a monthly author meet and greet called Dime Grinds. I'm also an actress who has worked with Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, and we're going to be talking about script writing today. This is aspects of writing. Okay. And we're, what we're going to, I want to start off with. I always in the past have asked, and this is interesting. I think I asked you this, Richard. I can't remember if it was you I asked. What software people use when it comes <laughs> to writing a script? Did I ask you that? I think I did when we were on the you phone. Did. Yeah. yeah, and he taught me something I did not know because we're used to Final Draft, we're used right. to Scriptwriter, we're used to you know. There's a lot of different sc- software out there, mm-hmm. but you were telling me about Word has a format, and, and you must know about that as, as well. Um, I do. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do. Go ahead, yeah. Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I. I'm very new into this, so when I was looking at making my short film, I just popped up and started writing anything on Word, and then they have that template thing, and then I typed in screenplay, I think, is is the template, and it popped up, and so I just started using it, and everybody was saying all the different formats that you mentioned, uh, James, and I was like, okay, but (laughs) Mm -hmm. this works for me, and it's... I don't have to buy anything. I don't have to purchase anything. You know, practically everyone has Word. So I would strongly recommend those of you out there with like looking at making scripts. If you have Word, there should be that template in there, and you can go to work. Nice. And it's fairly easy to use from what I see. So, yes. Renee, what do you know about that? Because yeah. I know you teach creative writing. That's one of the things that I teach in my class because not everybody is real techy. And learning some of the script writing programs takes some technical knowledge and time. And mm. only if you're going to do a lot of scripts really should you invest in it and do it. Otherwise, you yeah. can use Word. And yeah. I, I want to encourage both of you young producers and writers that so many powerful people today started out writing their own screenplay place and then using them. I'd, I'd like to tell you that Steven Spielberg's one, Francis Ford Coppola is one, uh, John Carpenter, Woody mm-hmm. Allen, George Lucas. They all yep. started out script writing either for other people and then eventually started doing their own things that they worked mm-hmm. with. So that's the way to go, guys. <laughs> You're on the right track. <laughs> well, you yeah. know, what's interesting, too, is when I started, when I, I wrote a script back in 1980. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's at least three people on this panel who weren't even born yet. But 
<laughs> Gee, thanks. Oh, well, <laughs> I was including uh, you in it. No. no, I won't say. I won't say a word. I will not say a word. Uh, I mean, in the studio. Now, anyway, <laughs> uh, I didn't know how to write a script, and I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, at the time. So I went to Georgia State University. I was actually taking classes there at the time. So I went to the library to write about, learn about writing scripts. I didn't realize there was software out there. And I looked at the various techniques that some of the um, writers were using in Hollywood. And actually, I, I think it was uh, Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't use your typical format for writing scripts. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I like the way he writes. So I, I use that format. <laughs> And then come to find out, it's really not what Hollywood expects, you know. Uh, and, but you know, hey, it got the attention of someone, you know. Yeah. yeah. So true. that was what whatever was works. Yeah. yeah. Script writing is the hardest thing to do. I, I teach that in my class. I, know. I think it's the hardest yeah. style of writing that there is because you have a visual medium occurring at the same time, and it has its own language. I mean, it has words like transition, slug lines, yeah. uh, you know, right. mm -hmm. Learning Vos, the vocabulary. OC, montages. <laughs> it has its entire its own vocabulary that yeah. you have to learn about what yeah. you're doing. Very true. But see, I think I, we talked about this in a show in the past, Renee, I find it easier to write a script, but I think it's because that's what I wrote first. Yeah, I never, I didn't write a novel in the beginning. I wrote a script. And to me, it was so easy to write that because of the format. And then from there, what I did, I would take a script and write a book from that script. You did so it backwards. I did it backwards. <laughs> I, well, yeah. But you know why it seemed easier for me? Because a script is typically 90 to 120 pages. Right. Exactly. And then... A novel, it, you should have at least 200 to 300 pages. And, you know, you, so you have to, you can expand on what you've written as a script and give more direction and, and more details. So that was easier for me. Because if you think about it, if you take a novel, now you have to convert that in, you have to shrink it down to 90 to 100. It. Yeah. I, think, I don't know why, I think that's easier. Yeah. You think that's easier? Yeah, because you got a lot of content and you just break this content down. <laughs> I'm just backwards. That's all I can tell you. I'm just backwards. <laughs> So, Marcus, I mean, um, Richard, what's your experience with? I know this is your first produced film, but what yeah. other scripts have you written, or have you written anything else yet? Uh, so, the interesting thing that you were sort of talking about is, so I wrote, directed, and starred in, and so in the process, I saw how much language you can use as just somebody, and I come from a theater world, so. It's you have to sort of say everything, and then the visual medium. What can be said without speaking? So I shot, right. and we're in in post production for my second film, and it's predominantly a silent film. Uh, we'll probably put some music into it, and then I have this little part I speak at the end. But the idea with that, James, um, was to try what can I what can be said without saying what can be said with the visual medium. So in that process of writing, it was, okay, what is this saying instead of, you know, my character actually going, oh, I'm waking up, oh, I'm tired, or uh -huh. <laughs> whatnot. Um, so, so that was a nice... showing the exposition versus saying it? Exactly, exactly. And I think, to Marcus's point about taking a 300-page book and converting it into um, a, a, a script is wonderful because James or anyone that's written, you know, you have these things about visually like what it looks like. So then you could just have the camera pan over that rather than, you know, whatever exposition you want to write. And I think that that's wonderful to pull from and be like, oh my God, I can see that images. I can see this. I'd love this shot. I'd love it to shoot from this angle or these kinds of things. And, and I could see a push in, I could see a pull out, all these different things come into play and your brain just starts going boom, 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 firing. Well, what I'm about gonna, a turn I'm of dialogue, though? How do you deal with that? All right. I'm going to let you guys keep talking. I'm going to adjust the camera. We can't see Tanya that well, and I know I'm very unprofessional here. We're doing this in the middle of the show, but I want to make sure we see her. Now we can see her. But I'm going to adjust that camera just a little bit, so you guys okay. keep talking. All right. Tanya, what was your question? What about the challenge of dealing with internal dialogue, the thoughts of your characters without being able to say it? I think... I think with that, you're, you're hopefully setting up the scene so that your actor or actors 
understand the world and understand what's happening. So it just so happens with that film I was describing, my second one, I was the main actor again, so I knew what was going on. But I think it's also part of whatever you're transforming onto the page and taking maybe from the source material and sort of saying, okay, what are we trying to convey? Because the other thing I'm, I'm big on is even just a set shot that's on a tripod, what is everything in that shot saying? What is that photo in the background? What is that book? Any of those sort of things, are they helping tell the story? Are they adding? Are they subtracting? Or um, are they enhancing? So I think uh, um, if that answers your question, uh, Tom. I, yeah, I have a question for everyone that when it comes to when you're writing your scripts, do you have a, a vision of who that character is in your mind? I'm going to start with you, Renee. Absolutely. <laughs> you have a very strong vision of who they are. And going along with what Richard said, the visual can carry a lot of that. You don't need as much dialogue. You don't need as much verbiage because the picture can give and portray what's happening. On the other hand, the dialogue and the script has to be poignant. It has to touch people. It has to reach them. Well, the reason I ask that question is, is because oftentimes, I, I brought this up once, once before, uh, I knew the director of Say by the Bell. Mm -hmm. And when they were auditioning the kids for the cast, the, and I cannot, I never can never remember her name, the young lady who played, she was the only black character in that television series. That was written for a Jewish girl. And, but when she auditioned, they said, that's her. This is, right. you know, so your, your whole perception of what you think is in a script may not necessarily be the right character for, or the right person for that, that character. Right. Or, or it can maybe, or it can, someone can change your mind anyway. Maybe it's the audition. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's the it person. something to keep in exactly. mind during auditioning. Just because you don't fit the role doesn't mean you shouldn't audition. That's what I was trying <laughs> right. to get at. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, so in other words, don't go into it thinking I'm never going to get this anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Of course not. And I think, Marcus, that is your attitude. Because you yeah. shared with me you don't have problems in Hollywood at all with anyone pigeonholing you in a certain way. And I think no. it's your attitude. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's me. That's yeah. who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in, in society as a whole, that's the way we all have to be sometimes. We have to walk into something. You had to do that, Renee, in Hollywood. Absolutely. She became an executive producer, in, right. and she had to place demands tell them the story i love this story tell them the story of when you you were you were getting a promotion to an, an executive producer's position and the two guys who were hiring you didn't know what to pay you <laughs> they got into a, an argument over what to pay me and i knew being a woman going for one of the top positions executive vice president that they would not pay me what they would pay another man so finally at, over lunch one day they said everybody write down a number on your business card on the back of the business mm -hmm. card and the closest two is what will pay you well ironically we all three wrote the same number and i got <laughs> hired instantly nice <laughs> perfect nice. yeah that, that's pretty amazing actually and you know you were there in the 80s and 90s I'm presuming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to say too much. Uh, you know. Yes, I was there eighty, nineties, oh, okay. early two thousand, <laughs> and then I moved to Las Vegas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I do want to know what's it. What's different in Marcus? This goes for actually everyone, including in, including you, Tanya. What What's different when it comes to writing something as opposed to performing something? Because you've all been actors. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as the actor, you're reading a script. That's one thing. Right. Do you think sometimes, because I, I hear this a lot in Hollywood, you'll be reading a script and you'll say, that's not my character. Mm -hmm. how, how much of that do you get a chance to say and how true is it that you can change the way the script is written? Depends on the director. Some people want it to feel organic. They want you to, to own the character and they're right. open to you expanding on what they Interpretation. wrote. Interpretation. And you know, I've heard it said, is it on the page? Then it's up to you. Okay, but mm. how about you, Marcus? What's your experience with that? Because you've been um, in quite a few big films. I mean, personally, I always give my opinion, you know, <laughs> okay. like all the time. <laughs> I mean, as an actor, you know, you have this character in your mind a certain way, and it could be a little different from how the director sees it. 
you know, but I've, I'll always, all the time, if I feel passionate about it and I don't think my character would say this or do that, I would say something. And 90% of the time they go with how I feel about oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, as uh, as someone who writes scripts and uh-huh. you're directing them as well, yeah. how lenient are you with your cast? Oh, I'm super, I'm all about freedom. Okay. You know, because as an actor, I know I know how to identify with the um, with the actors. They they love they love it, you know. Um, so anytime somebody come to me and have an opinion about something, I'm always open to listening to what they have to say about it. But the thing when it comes to screenwriting is that it changes all the time. You know, from uh, it's fluid when you when you're thinking about it to when you put it on paper, when you get into the rehearsals, when you start filming, <laughs> and it, it constantly literally changes. on the set that day, literally right. on the set that day, whatever feels great. So I'm all about um, what feels. Right, you know? Okay. Yeah. So that really is what, that's a huge difference if you think about it between a novel and, and a script. For those reasons. Exactly. I mean, because it can it can morph into something completely different than what it started out at. I, I think when you go to auditions, you have to play it the way you believe it in your 100%. heart. 100%. Right. And if you believe it strong enough, many times you can change the attitude of the producer or the director in, in their mind what Very they're true. looking for. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, they see your interpretation, and if they like it, you may get the job. Exactly. It's but all you about do need to make a it. choice. Exactly. Yeah, and just own whatever exactly. choice you make. Richard, I saw your little short, so I know what it's about, and I'm just curious yeah. that how much of that is true, what was in there. I mean, when you go to an audition, are people looking at you because of the way you look as far as your ethnicity or your size or... Are all those elements that someone's looking at when you're going for an audition? I, I think, I think fortunately and unfortunately, that would be the rule with anyone. So you walk into the room because it's a visual medium uh, that they need to see. They're looking at you, and they need to know. Okay, what is this? What is this person? Uh, what is what? What are they carrying? What What are they looking like? So Marcus looks as though he's somebody who could be in the military. So he, you were in Transformers 3, right? And you were with Josh. And so he has that commanding presence. So you could be like, oh, yeah, I could see him looking that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on top of that, obviously, he's a, you know, a black man. So great, we, we can get our... Uh, our diversity checkoff list, if that is going <laughs> right. through their mindset. And this, this, this is honestly some of the, the feelings that I get with, it, with, with casting people. And so then now, okay, he's going to speak his lines. Okay, great. He, he you know, did it really well, and I believe it. And, oh, my God, he's bringing something. But two, what everyone was saying is I completely agree about a choice. Uh, I think all too often actors will go in and try to do what they think is right, right or what they think is wanted rather than going, well, this is how I would do it. Exactly. And, going hoping uh, they do a good job. Mm-hmm. Ex- exactly, Marcus. Right. And it's just something where you have to commit to that. Mm-hmm. But I think from a writing perspective and from casting perspective, you have to to have a vision or something in mind, definitely you can you could be very open to have it be an open ethnicity, mm-hmm. but you have a thought of like where it's going. Particularly for mine, I need it to be strict with some of the ethnicities because it's for sure. it, it, it it's pushed by that. So I had exactly. to make sure it was authentic. Mm-hmm. And part of my film is about authentic storytelling. It's about who should be telling these stories rather than what happens so often still is whitewashed is is instead of it be played by an asian person it's a white person or a white person dressed up <laughs> or black right, face yeah. or brown face or all these mm-hmm. things um the other, so that's kind of the other thing you mentioned about diversity is also tall short fat i know right. i lost parts because i'm tall and they would say yeah. you can't play opposite mm-hmm. our star he's not that tall yeah that happened that's exactly right mm-hmm. yeah well i will uh, this is what's interesting because i can only really speak from an author standpoint for the most part i mean i've written scripts but i've never sold a script 
almost did, but not quite. So anyway, that's why. But what one thing that is interesting is, is and Tanya, you've been on a show where we've talked about this as well. When I wrote one book, I originally wrote it without describing a char- the characters because I wanted it to be as diverse as possible. I didn't want to be pigeonholed, and I wanted someone who's reading the book to relate to it no matter what their ethnicity is. Mm-hmm. But what what I discovered was is that when I went back to an editor, she said, you need to describe these characters. And I said, but why? And then it, I, it dawned on me because mine was about a specific race. Oh, well, <laughs> you have a lot. <laughs> and I didn't realize that the plot of this really right. dealt with the fact that, that you know, it dealt mm-hmm. with it dealt with diversity in mm-hmm. a sense, but it was about how specific race created us here on earth. Right. And so, you know, I had to go do that and I, I did it, <laughs> but I, I'm like Tanya and I know Tanya, that's your passion too, is to try to create more diversity in, in what we yeah. see and what we read. And I believe in that as well. Because sure. that's more true. It is more true to life. Yeah. Um, but and then I realized with what I wrote, well, in my case, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but the, the great thing about a script is, is, when it comes to producing something for the film or television, it doesn't matter what the script is, really. I mean, you can almost take, well, I don't know if you could take Medea and change that or not, but, (laughs) (laughs) but, you know, but there are some things that you you can write, and it really doesn't matter who's playing the part. Right, that's true. I'm, I'm trying to think of films where I know that has happened. But, you know, it is an interesting thing, whereas with a novel, and you can talk more about that, Renee, than I can, with a novel, because you were a couple Westerns, or certainly exactly. one, yeah. and obviously you had to be talking about where you were with, you know, whether they were Hispanic or whether they were white or whatever, because that's where they were. The locale happened to be in Mexico, in the Alps. yeah, and so you had to, <laughs> you know, you had Mexicans, and then you had white people, and you had cowboys, and you had all different types. You had urban mm. people. And now, however, there is a misnomer about how we look at ethnicity by region, because I know people from Mexico who are not brown skinned, that's who are actually <laughs> blonde haired and blue eyed, and grew, absolutely were born and grew up there. Yeah. So yeah. that's another thing we fail to realize that in this world today, it does not matter because we want to look at it in a certain way. Because if I mm-hmm. if I'm thinking Mexico, I'm Im- immediately thinking of someone who's of brown haired, darker skin, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. might not necessarily be the case. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times people who are Spanish speakers come up to me and start speaking in Spanish, expecting <laughs> me to understand. It's like, no. <laughs> no, no hablo español. <laughs> but that's yeah. a lie. <laughs> that sentence in itself is a lie. Yeah. It's interesting you touch on that because my last book, Holy Cause, is about terrorism. And that's the point, is that the terrorist is not who we expect it is. It's not yep. a 25-year-old a slightly dark-skinned, dark-haired young man. The terrorist mm-hmm. can be a woman, can be a child, can be anyone. And we have to mm. be far more alert about that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I wanted to know, when it comes to writing, actually the very first thing I wrote, I, I, it was just something stupid. I decided I was <laughs> I was watching General Hospital. We were, I, we were out of work. I was living with someone. We all were put out of work at the same time. And... I was sitting there. At that time, we only had three television stations. You're Boy, did that date me. Soaps. I know. I know. <laughs> and so, you know, she, she was doing her exercises watching General Hospital, and I'm forced to watch this if I wanted to watch TV. And Forced. Well, sort of. Right. By the third Every day. day. <laughs> yeah. By the third day, I actually was hooked. And, but the funny thing is I'm, I'm exactly. sitting there thinking, this is so stupid. Why am I watching this? And then I said to her, you know, we can write as, as good as this. And so anyway, we decided that we would sit down and write something. And, and I did. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I worked with someone whose brother was in Hollywood. And she loved it. And she said, can I send this to my brother? And you don't know who anyone really is. And so she sent it to her brother, and he loved it. And he said, can you create 16 episodes? I would like to make this the pilot. Nice. And then create wow. 16 episodes yeah. around. So we went back to the drawing board. I still had no idea what I was doing. I did not write in, in technical Hollywood format. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, they probably could care less. They, you know. And so um, I created 16 episodes. And he was pitching it for about six months in Hollywood. And right. then there was another television series about to go on the air called um, Hotel. 
And yeah. So, <laughs> and ours was very similar. You already and, saw okay. the punchline, didn't you? <laughs> he probably doesn't even know what hotel is. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's familiar with another product, too similar. And oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, so anyway, what happened was is that it got nixed. But, and I didn't know what that meant. I'm be honest with you, Renee. I really had no clue because I know you were around Hollywood maybe a few years later. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know what it meant to have a producer interested in your work because it was just a hobby. It was just something I was doing out of boredom. Mm. Um, would die for it today. And, you know, <laughs> and the thing is, is that I didn't even write my first novel or produce my first novel until 1995. So there was that huge lapse in time when I'm thinking you had a connection and you let that go, you know. Uh, and he died. So uh, yeah, I really let it go. Right. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, it's, it's interesting you said hotel because I had written a script called Tropicana, which was very similar oh, wow. to that. Okay. And then they came along with hotel, and mine got blown out. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wrote from what I I actually knew at that time. I was a captain in room service at one of the hotels here in Las Vegas, and um, so my characters basically dealt with that whole aspect of what if cocaine was brought into Las Vegas, and how would it be distributed, and you know, how would the captain get involved? And, and that's how it all took off. And then from there, he, you know. But anyway, it's interesting. <laughs> My reasoning for saying that is, is that how different is it to write for television as opposed to for movies? Because what I wrote was really a movie. But then they said, well, we'll turn that into a two-hour pilot. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they would pitch it as a television series. So what I wrote was really more of a movie, and then we went back and created episodes. So what's the difference in writing for television and – because an episode that's 30 minutes or an hour is not the same as writing a one-hour movie or a one-and-a-half-hour movie. Very well, true. I, I would say it in one word, discipline. Writing for television, <laughs> you are committed to have something at a certain length by a certain date – Mm -hmm. And it has certain parameters that are allowed on television. So it's discipline. And that's one thing that very often writers do not have. <laughs> well, then you have to think about commercial time. You have to know when to end a scene and when to start a exactly. next one. Whereas when you're writing a movie, you don't really have that. No. There is no intermission. No rules. Unless it's really. a three or four hour movie. <laughs> right. no like the old days. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I remember even when I was in Atlanta, the, the big thing they used to do there. They always show a lot of the old movies. They have one of the original old theaters that Fox built back then. And I remember with a lot of them, they would have like an hour and a half or two hours, and then they'd have an intermission and go back and show the second part of the movie. Well, you had to find a way to cut that movie in half because it wasn't produced that way. you know. Right. So. Yeah. No, writing for television is discipline. It, it, yeah. You have to be a disciplined writer. You have commitments that you have to live with and... If you don't do that, you're not going to be there very long. Yeah. Uh, Marcus touched on writing for movies. It gets changed a lot. Yeah. Your original <laughs> script will be changed many times, mm -hmm. maybe by yeah. the director, maybe by the producer, maybe by the lead actor who refuses to say the words you've written. Happens all it, can, the time. it can be all <laughs> kinds of things. Right. You have to be flexible and, and be able to go along with that. Mm -hmm. Well, Marcus, you're writing a television show, so... How how different is that for you for you as opposed to writing a movie? I just try to think of long term. You know, like with the movie, it's about ninety minutes to one hundred and twenty max. Try to keep it ninety; it makes more sense. Um, when it comes to TV, I just try to think about, like you said, I take in uh, commercials into consideration. Not to try to show certain things if I want this certain market. Right, and if you want to extend the, the television series, you you want to always keep it a little secret here and there exactly. so you can expose right. you things as you go along. Hook. So like over with the pilot, over it's like um, you kind of just plant a lot of seeds with the pilot. That way you have something to build on later. Certain characters, um, you know, like some, some things that you wouldn't really, I forgot the term they use, what is it? Um, like when you hide little things, like only some may see it, some may pick up on it, some may not. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like a gym or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? Or even an Easter egg. Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking Easter, but I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Christmas. Easter that's egg. why it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the things, too, when, when it comes to writing, I'm, when you're writing a script, like you said, the reason it's 90 to 120 mm -hmm. pages is because each page represents one minute of screen exactly. time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're writing for television, uh, is it pretty much the same way? Because you do have to make sure you have commercial time in, in, 
written into the script. Y you have to think about where those commercial breaks are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's, if it's a half hour show, it's much shorter. You're writing like 24 minutes, 26 minutes, depending on the amount of commercials. Mm -hmm. Right. So. And now even with um, online streaming, it's like a I was just about to say. Now. Yeah. yeah. You know, you really yeah. don't have to worry about commercials too much. Yep. Oh, you don't have to. Um, I mean, no. depends on the yeah. network. Like, for me, for example, I haven't um, wrote something that's been aired on TV as far as a, a TV show. Uh -huh. Like everything that I'm doing now, because I just started to get into TV, it's just been pilots. So I'm not even really familiar with too many of the rules. But you know, I binge watch a couple shows, and you know, the pilot could range anywhere from 40 minutes to like a little over an hour. I find what's fascinating, too, with television is oftentimes, I don't know if anyone here has been watching The Walking Dead. Yeah. Okay. What is interesting is, is there's a, one character in this specifically who was not written into the comics, and mm -hmm. he's been able to sustain throughout the entire show. And, yeah. you know, you, you do wonder how often things change. There's been characters killed that weren't killed in the comics, and then there's been characters that, that lived that did not live in the comics. Yeah. So, you know, how much freedom do you have? I guess you have all the freedom in the world. I guess it's the audience's choice. Exactly. If you can right. keep an audience yeah. based on a character and you don't want that character to go, yeah. although they killed off yeah. some pretty good characters in that, you know, so yeah. I don't know if I... You know. But I mean, at the same time, though, you have to have something for the mid-season finale or the season finale, and usually it's taken out somebody we care about. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Right. you know. It's, or it's you truth. think they're gone until you open the next season and then you realize, ah, oh, well, they fell off a cliff, but they survived <laughs> somehow. You know? Right. You got a limp now or something. Yeah. All right. Sometimes there's other reasons, too, about renewing contracts. And oh, well, that's true, thing, too. Whether they yeah, get rid of yeah. them or not. That's you true. Know? <laughs> or characters were difficult, so they wrote yeah. them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Hollywood changes a lot from uh, comics. When I started doing. The fan films, something I wanted to really pay attention to was the comics. Um, I wanted to stay true to the characters because, like I said, Hollywood changes like major things with um, the comic books, you know? So I, I try to stay true to it. What I do, I take these characters that already exist and create an original story behind them. Mm -hmm. And I listen to the fans. I'm just curious, what is everyone's... I always say I'm just as curious. That's one of my things. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to... Like, I went and saw Spider-Man last night. But I saw... Can't the way to see it. Uh, it was good. It was, it was excellent. Yeah, oh, yeah. But it, it was the cartoon-type version. I call it cartoon. Uh -huh. Animated right. version. Mm -hmm. um, what is different in writing animation as opposed to live action? Well, the stunts are easier if you draw it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to hire as big a crew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as far as like production value, you have a lot more freedom to do certain things. You know, if you wanted to jump off a building or blow this building up, it's a mm -hmm. lot easier to do it animation <laughs> yeah, versus, yeah, can yeah, I yeah, buy yeah. this building? I yeah. want to blow this yeah. up. Yeah. You guys yeah. have one <laughs> shot on this. <laughs> right. Yeah. An animation, though, is a very expensive medium. And you yeah. were in animation, yes, so you it know. It is a very yeah. expensive yeah. medium. There's good animation and bad animation. And yes. bad animation <laughs> cannot sustain a wonderful story, no matter how good the story <laughs> is. It'll yeah. ruin it. Yeah. So. Well, it, it actually is the artist who are responsible for making it work. Uh, as much as anything, and you have to have a good story and yeah. a good story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, you know the acting part. Everyone thinks, oh well, you're just sitting in a booth, and no. how much acting is there to that? But you know, there's probably quite a bit. You still have to have the. In fact, it would be harder, I would think, because the emotions have to come through on the mic. Look yeah, at Robin you, Williams' yeah. genie. Like that was not someone's drawing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. he made that. Well, that's true. That's true. I'll, and I know they say. Go ahead. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, well, I was just going to say, back to Tanya's point, I think 90% of his dialogue was improvised. Right. Uh, uh, they just so, let him go. Uh, they just let him. So they did the animation based him. on what he was saying. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, that's what I, that, that's the, the impression I got. Yeah. The, the, um, the, other, the other thing is you're not always working opposite an actor where you can play off of them and get that feeling. Many yes. times you're recording it just by yourself, your mm. part. And so you have to be a pretty good actor to get it across. Mm. Has anyone <laughs> sitting here done an animation other than I know you have, Renee? Yeah, I have actually. Okay, yep. Just thought about it <laughs> early, <laughs> early on in my career. I did. Um, 
And it was it was interesting. Uh, someone told me who what you did. What was the what were you in? Um, it's a movie called King of the Underground. Oh yeah, yeah. And okay. I played uh, Young Kenny. Someone talked about segment. you last night about that. So. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was cool. Like like uh, she said, you don't you're not acting um, in front of anybody, so you have nothing to go off on. You're not exchanging emotion at all. It's just literally reading the lines and kind of saying how the director would like you to say it. Right. It's it's challenging. Okay. I think it's more challenging than you know, acting for TV or film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Richard, have you done anything with animation? No, but to Marx's point and, and um, uh, to say this is, it is a sign of an actor because what you have to do is to say a line in multiple ways and a, a good actor, a trained actor knows what to do with a line. And sometimes a young actor or an actor that's, um, hasn't had that kind of training they have to get help or they have to be coached and it can be might be really hard or difficult for them but for somebody who you know one of the things actors some actors work with are actions so if you're saying a line you can say a line and you can flirt it or you can demand or you can do these kinds of things with it and if you've practiced that you're given a line and you're in that booth you could be like, I'm going to demand with this line. Okay. And then they're like, give it another way. And so you do it a different way. Um, and then they'll record you saying the line 10 different ways. Mm -hmm. And then in the production, they're going to go, mm, I like this way. Yeah. I like mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 it's not film footage. It's not set pieces. It's not everything. Because in normal film, you can't get 10, 15 times because the lighting might be off. The, the, the person walked or the sound might be off. But if it's... Uh, um, animation voice over essentially or voice you can do it 10 times and you're only in the booth for like <laughs> an hour or something like that and right. then you leave and <laughs> exactly. um, so that's that's speaking to Marcus's point you know about mm -hmm. uh, 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 gotta be good and gotta be on it's hard <laughs> yeah well I remember when Avatar came out. That was, was basically just, done. Oh, is that what you were going to say? About to, yeah. 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 And it was done on, you know, the actors knew that they, it was going to be green screen behind them. Yeah. And then they had that equipment they had to have on as well. Yeah. And sure. I mean, think about how uncomfortable that would be. And you've got to play that part you as dive if. dive in still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And pretend all that's all around you and it's nowhere. You exactly. Know. There like, are some actors who think that that should be its own course is learning how to act with a green screen screen because it's different. It's different from theater. It's different from a regular film. Yeah, that's very true. Like when I did uh, Transformers. Um, oh, was that's a, right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a moment when I was in the um, helicopter um, and, you know, <laughs> in the movie, it's real action packed. It's loud. You hear explosions in the background, people yelling and screaming. But in actuality, um, I, like I said, I was I was in a plane and I was sitting there. It was very quiet. It was a blue screen right here on this side of me. And I had to be real panicked. I had to act like my life was in danger. Um, you know, about yeah. to crash. And, you know, it was my part. Um, this is my first time acting on <laughs> You know, the blue screen, blue screen yeah. with Michael Bay right here in front of me, I, I better do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> or you, won't be on that, you won't be on that set anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I, I did I did my thing. You know, he, he really liked it, but it was completely different because I'm very comfortable and um, I display a lot of vulnerability when I'm acting with another actor. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, I'm very open. So when yeah. I'm there and I don't have an actor with me, I have this blue screen. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's very different. I don't, I'm not even sure how to. You almost have to put yourself in another universe, like take yourself out of there. Yeah. yeah. And you have to dive in to another level. Right. Mm. There's a synergy when you're acting with other people that mm -hmm. you're getting mm -hmm. some Creating feeding off together. Of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. A... And when you're acting by yourself in a booth or like you said with a screen, mm -hmm. it's different. It's totally different. You have to block out the real world and immerse yourself yes, in exactly. this world. So they, when it comes they, to they, script mm -hmm. writing for that, then how how do you get a mindset for that? Or do you not worry about it? Um, I, I don't worry about it. Certain things like that, I kind of just take. The, mm -hmm. the risk because I, I i the reason i'm asking you this is i'm i'm working on a script that deals with a book that i wrote i wrote the script but i realized this isn't going to work um because when i write i have a tendency to write in the present tense which is more like the way you would write a, a movie 
And I do that because I write it as a movie and I want people to visualize it like you would a movie when you're reading it. And a lot of, I realized, well, what I wrote, well, this, you couldn't possibly put together a crew like this, you know, unless it's been her or Cleopatra. And then, you know, who's going to spend that kind of money uh, to produce anyone's film these days. So, you know, you do think about the blue screen or the green screen because that's what they would have to do when you're writing something. I'm just curious, have any of you, when you've written anything, when it comes to a script, do you keep that in mind? Yeah. I think you do, but I think it's more important to keep in mind the story. Okay. Know? So you don't worry about that element? No. Yeah. I, when I first wrote my first film, um, I, try, I, I was free when I wrote it because I just wanted to get it out and write it. And then after I did that film, I learned, okay, I need to start writing within the means, you know? So I would put these barriers up for myself that what kind of, I mean, it would make me compromise. Like I can't have this huge building. I can't make the building on fire and people evacuate. And I got to find a way to still tell the same story using a different, like a, a different resource, something that I can, can obtain. You know, um, so when I'm writing, I take everything into consideration, depending on the budget. I write within the means of the budget. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. When you're writing something like that, as a script writer, that is something you have to be conscious of because you have to realize the reality of getting a script even produced today is very slim. And unless you do it yourself. Right. And even when you're doing it yourself, and then you really have to worry about a budget. <laughs> That's when, when the budget exactly. really comes into right. you know, play. I right. should right. mention, right. Now, that, now that you say that, we are having at the next Las Vegas Writers Conference, Tegan Koziak will be there, and she's taking pitches okay. for, for movies, television shows. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's not something that we get that often in Vegas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it and it is interesting how those can work because we we actually uh, Amanda Skinnador found her agent by going to someplace and pitching it to a literary agent. It was the agent. Las Vegas Writers Conference. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so you know it really can work. I've gone to these pitch fest fest in L.A. where you sign up, you get five minutes to pitch your work. How oh, Renee's got a grin on her face. <laughs> you go there and 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 the one I experienced was is you go to a board. You before you get there, you get to know who, what production companies are going to be there. Um, so you you only pitch your script to people who might be interested in the genre that you've written for. So they you stand in line like cattle, <laughs> 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 and then when they open it up, you run to the board and you write your name. And when you're done, you and you get to do this with eight different producers. So if it's filled already, then you have to find someone else who you and you, hopefully you get to pitch to eight producers. But the problem with that was now you have five minutes, and it's really not as easy as you think. That don't to sound get easy. Your, can, <laughs> you know, well, that's why they try to teach you to do a, a log line no more than one or two sentences, because oh, right. if you can practice that, then when it comes to there pitching you your work, mm-hmm. it's a little easier. But um, by nature, writers tend to be introverts, and they yes. find it difficult under five minutes to be able to talk yeah. about what they do. But it's something you have to learn and practice uh-huh. because it's Very an true. important part of it. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to tell your story attractively. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm working on right now, yeah. honestly. Like yeah. I can have this amazing idea, and when I'm getting ready to tell it, <laughs> it, do- it don't really sound amazing when it's coming <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was great in my head. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I know someone who's a pro at this. And, and you do, too, Tanya. And that, I think you know Two Bears Medina. No. Oh, you don't. Okay, you, well. You told me about it. Okay. Well, Two Bears, his expertise is in pitching his work and, and selling it. You know, um, what's it called when you just pitch it and they buy it and, and it's on option? Mm-hmm. He, he's really good at getting options. And what he's good at is he, he has someone who helps him, but they just write a great log line. And producers are interested in it. Most of the stuff he sold probably has not been produced, but it's the way that that pitch is done, and it intrigues them enough that they'll mm-hmm. option it. So he makes a living just optioning scripts. Nice. Now he's had some produced as well, but you know he really knows he's got that perfected, and that's mm-hmm. something I want to learn to do. You know, yeah. I have great story ideas, but you know, how do you convey this to someone in a short time? Exactly. That's going to make them want that script. Exactly. Right. Auditioning way easier than pitching your work. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just remember wow. what makes you different. You have to do something a little bit different to catch their attention. 
Yeah. Well, I will say this, that you started out as a model. Yes. And then you got into acting. And I, I want to say this because even when I, because I, I, years and years and years and years ago, when I was little, now I, I, I started out as a model as well. And one of the things we had to do was learn to do commercials. So, and we often had to create our own commercials as a practice to, to get into shape, as they say, for, uh, you know, going out there and auditioning. So that helps, I think. And it actually helps you shape your way as a writer when it comes to writing mm-hmm. scripts. Because in a way, even though you may not be writing it down necessarily, if you're just rehearsing it over and over in your mind, it's only like one or two minutes, and you've, you've written a script. It may only be one or two minutes, but that's truly what you've done. You've written a script. Today, if you watch commercials, a lot of them are many movies. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Many short stories have been made into feature films today. Which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Richard, we, you know, you you wrote a short short story. I don't know because I watched yours. I, you, I thank you so much, by the way, for sharing that. Um, have you? Did you have any idea of taking it further? So, uh, uh, to take a small step back to what you, what we were talking about, the the what I would say to people is if they're thinking of making feature films or something like that, I think if you can go in a smaller realm and look at just making a short version of something and see if you can tell a story in a limited amount of time, I think that's a great starting point rather than trying to go for 120 pages or a full-length feature. And I think from a writing perspective and a directing perspective, a lot of well-known directors, a lot of well-known people that are coming up through the ranks started in the short film genre and sold those things. And those can go to Sundance. They can go to um, um, Tribeca. So I think that's a, a, a wonderful way to start that ball rolling. In terms of uh, my particular film, the, the way I went about it is, there's this great book, I actually even have it here. It's called Steal Like an Artist, Mm -hmm. and it's really good for anyone just because there's nothing original. There really isn't, and the book goes through it. All of our ideas are uh, maybe a combination or something. So the book led me to look at this Vin Diesel film that he did in the 90s, and this Vin Diesel film was about being multiracial. It's called multifacial, but at the time... It wasn't in vogue as it is now. So he wasn't white enough for roles. He wasn't black enough for roles. So in a sense, then, I decided, oh, my God, that look is in now, this ethnically ambiguous kind of look uh, of which I fall into. So I took the source material, and I just copied it verbatim and just stole, literally absolutely stole, and then fine-tuned it as I went along. So I went, okay you know, change to this. His originally was 20 minutes. 20 minutes is now considered a little too long. So it was like, let me try to get in that 10 minute range. And then just bringing in today's ideas, today's things into that and fine tuning it um, to the point where I found, you know, my film, I was able to shoot it. At the time I finished it, I thought I was one off, one done, that's it. Um, soon after in the post-production, it became a, a, a trilogy and it became this, this character, Ryan, what is happening with him, what else is happening with him and what other stories can we tell about the industry or about his journey. So I shot, I shot out of sequence, I shot the third film in the trilogy and that's the one that's mainly silent that I talked about before. And then there's a second film, which is going to be very dialogue heavy. Um, and that is, I'm still working on that. And then we'll shoot that maybe in the new year. But now the idea might be that those will be in that five, six, seven minute range. And maybe to combine them all into one, you know, 30 minute ish short film. But that's not the end all be all. It, that can happen. Uh, so that's kind of uh, uh, where. My thinking has gone with the, the film and the and the journey. Um, I want to ask. I want to talk just a few minutes about once you've got your script ready to go. What's different 
avenues or venues you can go to to possibly sell that script. Because, you know, you can sit on it. I, I know someone here in Las Vegas who, who sent me a script six years ago. I couldn't do anything with it. And so far, this person hasn't done anything with it. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about when you have your ideas on paper and you think they're good enough to present, what are avenues you can take to get them presented? You mentioned having someone at your writer's conference. Mm -hmm. That's one way. I mentioned going to L.A. and going through the cattle thing. Uh, <laughs> we can query. You can query and get an agent or possibly a manager or a producer, but that's not easy these days. Right. Um, I know someone who actually produced their own film by going out there on Kickstarter and raising the funds. Mm -hmm. And they actually had someone who said, if you, we'll match you, they, they got what's called angel financing, mm -hmm. where we'll match you dollar for dollar that whatever you raise on Kickstarter will match that. And they did get the money, by the way. So I think there are a lot of different ways of doing it. But what are some of your suggestions for producing this, other than pulling out your credit cards and saying, here we go? Well, today on the internet, there's uh, different companies that will represent your scripts, and you can go that route, too. Like? Uh, I can't think of the name of the one, but there definitely is one uh, that you can submit your log line and your information, and they post them every week, and it goes to a lot of different producers, and if someone's interested, they in turn contact you then to see the full script. Okay. So right. that's another way to go. Right. Uh, certainly an agent is a good way to go. You Marcus, agent. you said you produced some of yours out of your own pocket. Yeah, I just produced my own. So you're not afraid of taking a chance? No, no. not at all. And I think that's sometimes what people have to do as well. They just have to say, I'll do it myself. I don't need someone else to do it for me. Mm -hmm. so. my, my first chance that I took was my very first feature called Love Triangle. And that um, came out a couple of years ago, and still today I'm getting messages from people uh, showing lots of love, um, asking for a sequel. My distribution guy loves it. He wants a sequel. Where can people see this? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazon, Hulu, it's on all VOD platforms. Well, you know, and I know Kelly, do you know Kelly Schwartz, anyone sitting in here? Yeah. Okay, so you know Kelly. Yeah. And Kelly did the one on Aliens. Yeah. And when it came out eight years ago, it made the circuit, but it looked like it had died. And then just a couple of years ago, it had a, re, you know, what do you call it, re revival. Right. And then it was, you know, it's been in Walmart. It's on mm -hmm. Amazon. Uh, Amazon just purchased it not too long ago, you know, yeah. uh, for a movie. Mm -hmm. So even something that seems to be dead in the waters, you can bring back. Yeah. You know, I learned a lot about distribution 20 years ago when I was trying to get a film off the ground. And I there were two films I was trying to purchase. And one was by a dermatologist here in Las Vegas. And another one was by Bill Hellinger, who is a retired character actor that retired here. And what was interesting is, is that both of them lost interest in their film because the distributors, one went bankrupt and one ended up being a crook. But, <laughs> Terrible. but for whatever reason, they lost interest in their own films. Mm. But what I found at that time through another investor was is that oftentimes a film that's shown some history of making a profit mm -hmm. can still go out there and make it in, in the, what back then was the video world. Right. So even if something's not successful on, on the theater circuit, it can still have grounds when it comes to like Nua Hulu or Amazon yeah, or, you know, BOD or platform. what is it called streaming when you download them? You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of different ways now to go out there and resell something. It's not any different than a book. Um, I've had a book that I recently brought back from 2005 from the dead. And then um, I have my very first novel I'm getting ready to re-release re as, as if it's new. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we can always take old ideas and reinvent them. I guess is the best For way sure. of saying it. <laughs> Richard, did you have any recommendations? There's a um, um, uh, blacklist. Is um, a friend of mine uses that site, and from what I know with that one, what he was telling me is he uploaded, and I think you can do television scripts, film, and you can get feedback from people. I think you might have to pay a little more. You can go back, and then they rank your script as well. So I think that's another great um, tool to use. And then, of course, if you know someone who's in the profession, so for instance, Marcus has done acting and has done some uh, uh, 
writing. So if you're familiar, know Marcus and be like, listen, Marcus, can you read my script? And then he can say, okay, this is where I think you can make some adjustments and changes. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate with mine that I was able to fine tune it from all these people I had met from school, from uh, um, my wife's work that were able to give me some suggestions. So I think that's part of this too, is just knowing that to fine tune it and going also back to the, the when you're filming, something will always come up. Something's always gonna affect the original intent that you had right. either as a writer or director. And that flexibility or that change or that viewpoint of like, okay, why did I have this shot? Why did I write this this way? Mm -hmm. Do I need that actor to say it exactly this way or can they, you know, have a little fun? Can they improv a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, and we've talked about this a lot uh, today, story. It has to help. It has to enhance the story. That's so the no, story has to be there or you have nothing in anyway. it. Of course. No matter. No, I mean, yeah. And even with, um, with that being said, when you have dialogue and you're writing something out, blocking is everything. You know, oh, yeah. because because of blocking alone, you may have to change a lot of the dialogue because it just <laughs> naturally doesn't make any sense, you know? Well, we're running out of time, so I would like to thank our guests, Richard McDonald, Renee Winner, and Marcus McFadden, along with our co-host, Tanya Todd. And I would like to ask you, Richard, real quick, where can we find out more information about you? Uh, so probably my best social media platform is Instagram. Uh, and I'm at rjm.actor on Instagram. And then you can reach out right. to me and contact me. Okay. And Marcus? Uh, McFaddenFamilyFilms.com. Okay. And Renee? You can contact me at winters.rena at yahoo.com and also through the college. Okay. And Tanya? My website? M-S-T-O-N-Y-A-T-O-D-D.com. Okay. All right. To find out more about our guests, you'll find links on our on the Aspects of Writing website that will click on their picture, and it'll take you to their sites. Uh, just go to AspectsOfWriting.com. There you will also find video information and YouTube channel. We will be on Roku TV. This show will also air uh, on iHeart, iTunes, um, and about a dozen other different networks. Nice. Twelve different terrestrial stations. We're live at 1 o'clock p.m., but it's Pacific Standard Time um, on Saturdays. And then we rebroadcast the show on Blog Talk uh, Radio at 9 o'clock on Sunday evenings. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, <laughs> and I understand we're now, I haven't seen it yet, but I understand we're streaming on Amazon. So someone might want to check that out and let me know. <laughs> I don't syndicate the show. Someone, someone else does. Uh, so if you'd like more information again about the show, just go to aspectsofwriting.com. And until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show today. Thank, Thank you. you. Love Thank, that. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.